We're giving away a Remington Model 700. We're giving away a custom knife set and also some African. Well, she has blood on the back of her yeah. shirt and she still goes out with me when I go. I haven't been since 90. Welcome to the Safari Show, where big game hunters show off their trophies and shop for their next hunt. Today's global hunter can shoot cheetahs in Namibia, blue sheep in Nepal, or just gazelle in New Zealand. You get many guns as you like. You're only allowed to carry five kilos weight of ammunition per hunter. Many hunters here are wealthy, from old-fashioned oil men to newfangled software millionaires like Randy Turpin. Randy runs a U.S. company that designs satellites for NASA. But he's been hunting since he was a child, and now he's after one of the world's most formidable and adorable animals. Fantastic, isn't it? That's uh, not even uh, what they say a giant one. It's uh, eight and a half, nine foot, so. I can't imagine that, though. How are you, Randy? Hi, Jerome. Jerome Knapp isn't your average safari salesman. He sells bear hunts for Canada's Inuit, and he knows how to hook a hesitant hunter. Karen's a little worried because she thinks that with a polar bear, uh, it's one of the only things that hunt man, really, OK? It stalks man. Any man going bear hunting yep. is doing it for the vicarious thrill of, of hunting something Dangerous. that is dangerous inherently and can kill you. I, do. I don't well, want to hear that. But I, I promise you we'll get him back in one piece. Thank you so much, John. Okay. Randy is hooked, and he's ready to put down the 20,000 American dollars this hunt costs. Polar bear hunting is probably the most exotic hunt you can do. If you go in anybody's trophy room, you'll probably see a lion, you'll see leopards, but you'll go one in 500, maybe one in 5,000, that you'll see a polar bear. As long as he brings it home wrapped in white paper like it came from the supermarket, it's fine. <laughs> it's kind of fun to have people over that have never tasted wild game and to, uh, you know, serve these, uh, these different dishes to them and, uh, and see what their reaction is. And on each one, she'll have what it is, uh, this antelope, this is wild boar, this is alligator, this is venison. Nathaniel Kallick is stalking different game. He's an Inuit guide from the Canadian Arctic, who's here to add some exotic flavor to the polar bear pitch. Nat hunts for his daily food, and this is his first glimpse of the big game hunting world. Oh, it's um, almost unbelievable. <laughs> See a lot of things over here. The sports hunting, uh, it seems to be a game. They're like trophies, you know. Well, there's lots of animals that I never saw before. <laughs> I only seen on TV. Two worlds are about to collide as modern urban cowboy meets northern native guide. Hi there. Randy Turpin. Hello, Nathaniel. Nathaniel from Mercury. Yeah, nice to meet you. I'm going polar bear hunting with you. Yes. It's me. This is the start of an Arctic odyssey that weighs the life of a bear against the survival of a people. It's a hunt that's unlike any other in the world. Four thousand kilometers north of Reno, it's the start of spring in one of the last outposts on Earth. <laughs> 150 people live in Resolute, on the edge of the Arctic Ocean, where the artifacts of the global village are replacing those of an ancient one. Resolute is bear country, with a quarter of Canada's 15,000 bears. And hunting them is part of daily life. (laughs) 
Randy's guide Nathaniel is Resolute's most respected bear hunter, but it's hard for him to make ends meet. Modern Arctic life costs more and more money, and traditional hunting doesn't pay. Many local hunters have gone on welfare, but Nat has adapted to the times. He's organized local hunters to sell off some of their bear licenses to sports hunters at places like the safari show. Instead of making $800 for a bear hide, they make 15000 as bear hunting guides, and the whole community shares the money. They're learning to keep up with the times by using their old hunting skills. A lot of people from our village thought this could not be done by individual. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, Inuits are too dumb. <laughs> yeah. That's what they thought. Nat's wife, Martha, grew up in an isolated village without electricity, and she learned to hunt at five. Today, she's got a nine-to-five job, but she still loves to go hunting with Nat. Today you gotta get up this time of the hour, you gotta go here at this time, you know. Everything's timed, but out there you pretty well live. You don't worry about the clock so much. Martha can forget her clock for a while because the latest flock of sports hunters is just arriving, including Randy Turpin. These hunters have flown in from as far as France and Brazil, but they've all got one thing on their mind. Oh, we go after bear. I've been on the, the, the brown bear, the grizzly, uh, the, the black bear. Uh, this is the first time I'm, I come across a polar bear. I, I up a big, a big polar bear. Why big? Why big? Because it's a trophy. It's very important. Dream bear is a ten and a half foot bear. That's what they call a dream bear. I would love to get one in five days. I'm also willing to stay for 18 days if that's what it takes to get one. Each hunter travels alone with his own guides. But Nat makes sure they're all equipped with caribou skins as they head into weather that can kill them in hours. One hunter refused to listen and lost his toes to frostbite. Oh, good. You look good. <laughs> like a glove. <laughs> but modern day adventurers just don't trust old fashioned gear. Like most, Randy's brought along the very latest Arctic fashion. I bought the best equipment that you can get. It's a cover here with, with a thick uh, pad underneath with a special uh, underwear under that that uh, wicks everything away from your body. So I think the whole thing's around $2,000. I have a global positioning system that uh, works from eight satellites and it, it uh, makes exact position within 150 feet of where you are on the Earth. When we get out there in the great Arctic, all I have to do is to say, go home, and uh, we go to it, so. <laughs> but can Randy's gadget lead him to bear? This Pennsylvania oil man just spent 10 days on the ice without seeing a bear. If you can't stand cold, don't come up on this hunt. <laughs> if you want to make it uh, real simple, it's, it's a pure hell hunt. <laughs> it is rough, it is cold, and it, it is, it's nothing like it. At 4 p.m., Randy and Nat prepare to leave. All sports hunters are led by Inuit guides and travel by traditional dog sled.
but dogs are just part of the Arctic lure for Randy. It's a more romantic thing than sitting on a skidoo, and you don't have to listen to the motor, and you can discuss things while you're while you're going along. Now, I've been on skidoos before. I've never been on dog sled. <laughs> oh. And so, Randy heads off into one of the most desolate parts of the planet on his Arctic safari. Randy must travel by dog sled to make the hunt more challenging. But a convoy of skidoos follows, carrying 10 days of food and supplies. His Arctic Sherpas include Hans and Nat's wife, Martha. She's brought along their teenage son, Greg, to get him away from the TV. The hunt takes them across the Arctic Ocean, which is frozen for another month. There is no vegetation, and the only natural food is seal and bear. The Inuit always travel at night because huskies like cold weather. This evening is perfect, minus 25, though it's not quite as perfect for tourists. Yesterday, when you were staking the dogs out here, put some together with other dogs and stuff, uh, why do you do that? The dogs that are together are family, like mother and son or brothers. If I put different families together, they fight. It can get as bad as killing each other. They stop often to search for bears, which spend all spring hunting for seal in this outdoor freezer. It's too much rock ice here, so we, we try going on the side. The dog sled's runners are made of cotton and ice and must be sanded smooth every few hours despite temperatures that have dropped to minus 30. As the temperature plunges, Randy brings out the last piece of his state-of-the-Arctic fashion. This is my last line of defense right here. <laughs> The polar bear will not see him, so I <laughs> camouflage up here. That's right, yeah. What do you think a polar bear will do if it sees him? I don't know. <laughs> this is a mating season now. <laughs> <laughs> it's three o'clock in the morning in the land of the midnight sun. This time of year, the sun never sets, and the days are as long as you make them. At four o'clock in the morning, they finally spot what they've been looking for. Polar bear tracks. It's a female. The class are more together than the male. The Inuit don't shoot bears with cubs to protect their future hunting. These two were mother and cub. We'll wait for them to grow up and we'll get them <laughs> in about a few years. First polar bear track I've seen in my lifetime. Something else.
they make camp in the middle of the ocean. Tents are less work to put up than traditional igloos, especially if you're a tourist. But Randy does have one task to perform before bed. We're now at uh, 73 degrees, 11 minutes north, 93 degrees, 45 minutes west. And uh, I have no idea where that is, and I have no idea where the polar bears are, but that's where home is, in that direction down there. The second morning, the hunters awake to a howling storm. It's minus 40 with a wind from hell. Randy has put away his fashionable outfit and is testing Nat's caribou skins. It's colder than anything I've ever seen outside. If your cheeks get into it for just one second, they burn. And uh, the caribou itself, when I feel it down here, I don't feel any, uh, any wind through the caribou at all, so it's working really well. Nat decides to sit still until the storm blows over. And in this part of the world, you can sit still for a long time. I've been hunting ever since eight years old. What was your first hunt? Do you remember? A caribou. Caribou, yes, really? Yes. Man, you had big hunting. Oh, yeah. First thing I ever hunted was rabbits. You must have been proud. I wasn't standing on the ground. I was I know. flying a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if you catch a polar bear, whoa, that, that's, you know, something else. You, be, you become a man. Matt's son, Greg, is getting some manhood training, too. His dad sent him out to build an Arctic outhouse because answering nature's call can be a risky business out here. Even the food is frozen. Arctic survival rations used by the army. But Nat has brought along a special treat, some fresh Caribou. The storm has finally blown over, and things are looking up for Randy. Appears to be okay. Randy is testing out his new $8,000 rifle. This is a uh, Blauser. It's made in Germany. It has a Swarovski scope on it, which is made in Austria. Now this is a smaller rifle than his. An RCMP sold it to me for about 100 bucks. He asked me if I wanted to uh, buy this rifle. So I said, yeah, why not? Hey, 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 hey. It's pretty good after being camped up there in a tent for three days, huh? Oh, yes. How are you doing back there? Still warm. I think these caribou skins work pretty good. Why? Why?
They're entering rough ice, heaved up by the ocean below. It takes as much manpower as dog power. A sharp right turn, huh? Next stop, they find signs of a struggle. It's the remains of a baby seal, eaten by a bear which smashed its paws through four feet of snow and ice to get lunch. I couldn't believe him. that polar bear had to just stand up and smack like that, you know? And fast enough, remember, that that seal can't back down that hole to get out. The polar bear ate the skin and the fat and a little bit of the meat. That's what he likes the most. <laughs> In spring, seals give birth to their young under the Arctic ice. And where there's seal, there's usually bear. I think I found them. Can you see Randy? Is he moving, Martha, or staying there? On the left side. Do I see him? Right there, look at that. Can't be any more than six feet. In fact, it's seven and a half feet, exactly what the Inuit like for food, but smaller than the big bears most sports hunters want for trophies. I'm looking for a nine foot plus bear. So it's too small. Too small for what? Too small for me. <laughs> too small for what I'm looking for. Too small for what I came up in this countryside to, uh, to find, really. If this was your bear, would you go after it? If it was mine, yes. This polar bear, it's, it's fat and it's tender. It's perfect uh, for food. <laughs> He's looking to eat it, I'm looking to mount it. So there's two different kinds of bear here. That's going to find me a much bigger bear than this one. I don't even worry about it. To sports hunters, size matters. But Nats people have never had this luxury. The Inuit have been in the Arctic since 2000 BC. And until recently, their life changed little, as seen in this legendary 1920s documentary about Nanook of the North. In a land without fruit or vegetables, they hunted for their food, and it usually fought back. In the last 30 years, Arctic life has been transformed as skidoos and row housing replaced igloos and dog sleds. But hunting is still an important part of the local economy. Many Inuit still depend on hunting for food, especially the elders who can't afford northern groceries flown in at twice the price. Young hunters always bring them some of the meat, and the elders waste no part of the animal. No opponent is revered more than the polar bear, the Arctic's national symbol and a mark of great pride for any young hunter who gets one. At 16, when I first caught my polar bear, bringing back that meat to the community, um, 
it's instilled pride uh, that I, I could never get in school. The polar bear, it's huge. And when you see one in action, it's a hair-raising experience. The Inuit call the polar bear Nanook, the wanderer. And half of them live in the Canadian Arctic, where they are protected by international law. Only the Inuit can hunt them as part of their aboriginal rights. But the number they harvest is tightly controlled by government wildlife authorities. Polar bear biologists keep track of the population from outposts along their migration trail. And they determine the annual quota that can be hunted. This lonely cliff is manned by Ian Sterling, one of the world's most respected polar bear biologists. If you were to ask the person on the street in Toronto or London, England, if polar bears are endangered, probably most of them would tell you that they are, but in fact they're not. There's probably 25 to 30,000 of them uh, worldwide. We've probably got 15,000 or so here in Canada. So there's actually lots of polar bears. We have estimates for all the populations. We have quotas for all of the populations. We monitor the harvest. Most years we're taking in the vicinity of 500, and that's a sustainable level of harvest. About 500 bear licenses are divided among northern communities each year in one of the most tightly regulated hunts in the world. The lucky hunters are chosen by lotteries held in each village in one of the most exciting events of the Arctic season. Each community also has the right to sell a fifth of its licenses to outside hunters. This means some people must sacrifice their birthright, but it's worth it in many small communities where there's no other work. The lottery is organized by Ben Kovic, head of Northern Wildlife Management. If I sell the polar bear myself, I'll be lucky if I get a $800, $900 out of one bear. And then when you look at a sporn hunt, you're looking at $15,000. Hunters and trappers start getting ready for the hunt. The cook and women start making clothes. For one bear, you're employing at least average of seven, eight people. You won't find any opposition to bear hunting in the Arctic. The only criticism comes from humane societies in the south. They say bear hunting is an outdated practice when groceries are available throughout the Canadian Arctic. But buying your food doesn't provide an important part of the Inuit diet. Traditional pride in a changing culture caught between the old world of mukluks and the new world of Nike. This is a Iqaluit the North's new capital and most modern town, with 4,000 people. Here, many young have lost all connection with the hunt. They get a regular dose of American culture, and many have never eaten traditional food, let alone hunted it. Polar bear meat, I personally have never tried it. I'm not much of a hunter. I'm not into the traditional foods like my ancestors were back then. As hunting life loses its glamour, many Inuit are caught in a no-man's land. Unemployment and alcoholism are soaring, and the suicide rate in the Arctic is now the highest in the world. Many once proud hunters are on welfare and can't afford to go hunting because of the high price of Arctic equipment. Hunting is damn expensive. It costs up to $2 for a bullet. A five gallon tank of gas is 25 bucks. A machine can cost you $12,000. Hunting is expensive. 
Dennis Patterson is the former member of parliament for Canada's Northwest Territories. He led the push to legalize sports hunting so Inuit hunters could earn a decent living. Polar bear sports hunting provides cash to support the hunting economy. And the money helps sustain the way of life. It's ironic that it's the outsider's money that helps sustain a way of life that sustained itself in the Canadian Arctic for thousands of years. North 74 degrees, 26 minutes, 35 seconds. West 94 degrees, 28 minutes, 33 seconds. It's been two days since Randy passed up his seven and a half foot bear. And they haven't seen one since. They've followed several sets of tracks, but all have disappeared in the snow. The slow, cold pace of Arctic hunting is starting to have an impact. It's the eighth day of the hunt. I feel a little different from what I thought I would feel. It's a, it's like a loneliness almost. It's a, it's a camp fever. It's a it's a urgency to get something. We trail them and we can't see them, they're gone. We see tracks and then there's no tracks. They're like a phantom almost. Where did you learn the English? Uh, I used to go to school in Ottawa. It was so different from my hometown that I was, it almost broke me. <laughs> did it? <laughs> yeah. Like I was taking drugs and drinking. And I told myself, but that's not me at all. So, yeah. so I, quit, I quit school and I went back home. <laughs> right now I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't make drugs. I'm clean now. <laughs> I'm living a lot happier now. Yeah. After just over a week, Randy is tired and cold. The romance of the dog sled has worn off, and he's ready to be towed by Skidoo in an Arctic box seat. <coughs> Nat will travel alone by dog sled, and Randy will get back on board if they spot a bear. For three more days, they battle harsh winds and thick ice. They spot a few bears, but all are mothers and cubs. It's 74, 49 north, 94, 49, 58 west. Food supplies and spirits are running low when they're luck starts to turn. Randy can barely contain himself. Tonight we're going to have some polar bear. We have the prince and we're going after him over there. Tonight we're going to eat polar bear. <laughs> Nat is going to follow some fresh tracks and Randy is convinced this is it. We just found some tracks of a nine foot polar bear after being on this ice for the last 11 days, going crazy, being cold, and now we're right on the verge of getting them. Feeling great right now, but 
really was despondent, but a little less than 15 minutes ago. You sure that he's got it this time? Well, you never know, but I mean, if you want a full range of emotions, go hunting, I say. Go hunting, young man. <laughs> It takes three hours for Nat to return, with word of another victory for the bears. I cannot track it down. They were quite a, quite a ways off. They were quite a ways ahead of it. Damn! Can't believe it. Disappointment again. Bears went off into the rough ice and the couldn't follow them, so it really is a roller coaster for your emotions, I guess. That's what I would call it right now. There's word that the other hunters have gotten their bears or given up and gone home after the standard 10 days. But Randy has asked to have fresh supplies sent out to him on the trail. This will cost him another $1,000 US and $800 more for each day he stays. His dreams of a big nine-foot bear are shrinking by the day. Seven feet enough? Seven feet's fine. Yep. Seven feet would be fine. This late in the hunt, seven feet would be fine. Why can't you just stay another ten days, right? I'm used to schedules. I usually have a yearly schedule. Something like this is just working into my scheduled time. So I guess it makes you different from me anyway absolutely different from you. They don't have to get to 8 o'clock meetings, they don't have to get to anything else. Like, hungry you eat, tired you sleep. But the Inuit don't seem any happier about the long schedule than Randy. Oh, I'm homesick. I'd rather be home now, I guess. But I thought, I thought the Inuit liked the land. Not this long. We like hunting, but sometimes it gets the best of you, I guess. Why do you think it's taken so long for him to get even though, like a seven footer? I don't know. Every hunt is different, like a person is different from anybody else. A hunt is usually different every time we go out. But this is the most different. Yes, yes. This is extraordinary. But I still want him to get a big one though. <laughs> Randy has a new problem. His fancy satellite gadget has gone dead. Damn! One of these buttons was hit, see? Raced all the damn waypoints out. <laughs> Isn't that the <laughs> shit? <laughs> Damn. Can't believe it. For two more days, they crisscross the Arctic, searching vainly for tracks. but their spirits are improving. The weather is warmer, and fresh cuisine has finally arrived. The Arctic is revealing her beauty, and friendships are forming. Randy is adapting to Arctic life, and slowly becoming Nanook of the South. <laughs> you get it all the way back. Uh, 
a bush plane will pick Randy up in one day. But he seems strangely at peace with his bearless bear hunt. Hunting a polar bear, hunting any size polar bear, is an absolutely fabulous thing. Uh, you can get a seven foot polar bear, six foot polar bear. The size of the thing doesn't mean a damn thing. It's the remembrance of it, it's the experience. Learning how to keep warm, learning how to go to the bathroom. Very simple things that everyone takes for granted. It's a total experience. I'll never forget the rest of my lifetime, whether I get a beer or not. It has never taken Nat so long to find a bear. And the battle has become personal. I was trying to get tired of it earlier, but not anymore. I, I can go on. I, I want that polar bear. <laughs> This is taking so long, it needs a good ending. <laughs> but there's only one day left. Go, Mark. And so Randy prepares to leave the Arctic. Oh. Day 16. The last day I'm smiling, not because I have polar bear, but because it's the last day. So who knows what's going to happen. We're going to go today until tomorrow and uh, we get a beer. If we don't, tonight I'm sleeping in a bed, an actual bed. So that's my motivation today. <laughs> they have traveled almost a thousand kilometers in 15 days. They have seen a dozen bears, mostly cubs, and the biggest bear was the one Randy passed up 10 days ago. But you never know what lies ahead. I see one polar bear. He seems to be alone. It's a big male, isn't it? Huh? It's hard to tell from here. We're gonna have to be closer. Yeah, okay. I'll believe it when I see it. We've gone through these drills before and I got all excited and let down and so now I'm waiting. So this is uh, this is the final day, the final hour. And uh, it'd be nice, but uh, I'm not planning on it yet. They follow the bear through rough ice for three hours, then lose it in a whiteout. I see one polar bear. He seems to be alone. I think that's the one we're looking for. Is he seven feet? It could be more than that, I think. <laughs> it's way up there, huh? There he goes. He's taking off running. Is that right? Running to the left like hell, running like hell. Let's go get him. The sled goes as far as it can on the rough ice, and the hunters meet the hunted. <laughs> And, uh, you see it? Let me see it. Hey. Hey, nine foot hey. 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 Okay, now. Should I shoot him again? Uh, no, he's down. <laughs> All right. You are losing. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, that was really close. How long stay? <laughs> After you see the animal down, it's a little sad because they're a magnificent creature. So why shoot it? It's part of what I do. It's part of the hunt. And to the people who say, why not shoot it with a camera, what do you say? I say, come on up and shoot it with a camera. That's their hunt. This is my hunt. <laughs> Before going to meet Randy's plane, Nat skins the animal, as his ancestors have done for centuries. This meat for you guys. I'll show you what I got for me. Two tenderloins to go south. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So I'll have those, and that'd be great, huh? Randy will take home a little meat with his bearskin trophy. The rest of the animal will be brought to Resolute to divide among the elders, who will use every part and feed the scraps to those who've earned it. Thank you, my man. It was a great hunt. For Randy, the adventure is over, and it's time to return to real life. This is probably the most difficult hunt I've ever been on. I'll remember it always, but I'll never come back here again. This is one time in a lifetime for me. <laughs> now I have to move on, do something else. But for Nat, this hunt is his life. And he hopes it shows others that the old skills still have value for a modern day Nanook. I am alive today because my father's been hunting by a dark team. I want to keep my tradition. And the younger people are learning uh, from all this. At the same time, uh, we're giving those younger ones hope if they try hard enough. And Nat is trying to get home before the ice melts. Now that safari season is over, he's free to do what he really loves. He can go hunting on his own.